I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. A young life full of promise. His dream was to become a fireman. Fireman, football player. Shatter. How long have you been in the custody of Florida? 23 years. Locked up, sentenced to life behind bars at the age of 15 for shooting a man in the head. You felt he deserved to die. Why? Today, in a new jailhouse interview with our Michelle Sagona. Why are you making the decision to speak out to Crime Watch Daily? Mark Berrios finally reveals his dark secret. Why he took the life of 47-year-old Lee Hepler. I haven't even told my mom this. This is the first time this is ever coming out of my mouth. Plus, a pretty 19-year-old college student meets a flirty, wealthy frat boy. But he turns out to be the devil in disguise. <laughs> I had never experienced terror at that level before. Today, how this brave survivor is helping millions of other women. At the end of the day, I know it was the right thing to do. Right now. Let's go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, when is a killing not a crime? For convicted killer Mark Berrios, he admits he pulled the trigger and ended a man's life. But he says that's only half the story. Our Michelle Sagona is here now with the controversial case. Chris, I am at the Northwest Florida Reception Facility in Chipley, Florida. It's a prison where Mark Berrios has spent more than half of his life for a murder he committed when he was only 15. Now, the story behind the case has many believing that he shouldn't have been put here in the first place. Mark Berrios is a confessed killer. How long have you been in the custody of Florida? 23 years. 23 years. Yes, ma'am. At just 15 years old, he put a bullet in the head of a man who had taken him in off the streets. When they came back and said guilty. Oh, well, that hurt. Did you cry? Yes, ma'am. But the murder is not Mark's darkest secret. This is the first time you've ever yeah, told the truth? I haven't even told my mom this. This is the first time this is ever coming out of my mouth. And what he tells me now raises a painful debate. Is Mark Berrios a cold-blooded killer or a teenager who used street justice to become an unlikely hero? Why should anyone believe you? Mark Berrios was the typical rambunctious boy growing up in Jacksonville, Florida. His dream was to become a fireman. Fireman, football player at that age, you know, they want to be everything. He was one of three children and the spoiled baby of the family. We had a pretty good life here in the beginning. We just entertained with ourselves, but of course we picked on him because he was the youngest. By the time he was a teenager, his sister Nicole wasn't the only one in the house picking on Mark. Did things happen there? My dad is very abusive, like physically, so. I know he hurt Mark. Mark's parents eventually divorce, but now his mom, Margaret, is forced to work long hours to support three kids. I wasn't really at that time paying a lot of attention to him. You know, I was working, I was, got my real estate license, and uh, he just got lost. At a very young age, Mark was on his own. At some point, Mark starts running away from home. Why do you think he did that? because he wanted some things in life that I couldn't provide him. Some Air Jordan shoes, he wanted to drive at 14, 15 years old. And I just wouldn't let him, so he rebelled a little bit. Petty childhood rebellion soon escalates into real trouble with the law. Mark beats up a classmate. That has to weigh very heavily on you. It does, because I blame myself. I should have been watching him better. At just 15, Mark is sentenced to a 30-day program for troubled teens in Daytona Beach, but Mark doesn't stay long. He was in and out of that program. He ran from that program, you know, we brought him back to court and uh, he ran again and he just really would always come home though. 
until he ran into this guy, a 47-year-old used car salesman named Lee Hepler. Did you have any idea he had met a 40-something-year-old man? I did not know this. Hepler spots Mark standing on a street corner and stops to pick him up. He told him he needed a ride to Jacksonville, and that's where it all started. Hepler drives Mark home, then gives Mark his number and tells him to call him if he ever needs anything. Of course, I was angry with him for running from the program and taking a ride from a stranger. He told me he was a very nice man, blah, blah, blah. Margaret orders her son back to the juvenile program to finish out his 30-day sentence. Mark doesn't stick around for long. I was actually waiting for him to come home because he was oh that was his M.O. He would run away and come home. He got hungry, he would come home. He was just always coming home. But this time, Mark doesn't run home to his mom. Instead, he makes what will be a tragic mistake. Mark calls Lee Hepler. Mark says after he met Mr. Hepler in Daytona Beach, the man brought him here to his home where Mark stayed with him as a young teen for a number of nights. Hepler didn't have any children, but his home was a fantasy land for teenage boys. They had different size clothes in the closet for different size children. He had video games for them. He had bicycles, he had motorcycles. Hepler takes Mark on an airplane ride, gives him an ATM card. Here's a card, $200 on it. He bought him alcohol, he let him drink, he let him drive. He even takes him to the happiest place on earth. Did you think he was just being nice? That's what I thought. But the naive 15-year-old is about to step into a living hell. What did he do specifically? He asked me if I want to watch porn. And I was young. I was like, yeah, okay, no problem. And um, put on the porn and just watching it and started to put his hands on me. Hepler's generosity comes with a price. He wants something in exchange. Mark's body. Instead, Hepler gets a bullet. What did you do? I shot him. You just shot him in the back of the head. Did he die instantly? Mm -hmm. I didn't mean, I didn't, don't even remember shooting him. You felt he deserved to die, why? Up next. Why in 23 years are you making this public? That's a hard question. After more than two torturous decades, Mark Berrios bears his darkest secret. Would you say you held back because you were embarrassed? Of course. I was ashamed, I was embarrassed, I was hurt, I was everything. Now back to our all new interview with a convicted killer in Florida, a man some believe should be let out of prison today. Once again, here's Michelle Sagona. Chris, Mark Barrios told me he doesn't dispute he killed a man when he was just 15 years old, but he says it was not a calculated murder. He insists it was in a desperate move to protect himself. Mark Barrios is about to tell Crime Watch Daily a story he's never told anyone. Why are you making the decision to speak out to Crime Watch Daily? I just woke up one day and was like, I can face this. I can, I can do this. For 23 long years, the convicted teenage killer has only revealed part of what pushed him to murder Olin Lee Hepler, a 47-year-old used car salesman who took Mark in off the streets. What happened that night specifically? We were watching a TV program and uh, he told me, come sit next to me, he wanted to talk to me, so I went over there. Mark, just 15 years old at the time, remembers every disturbing detail. He started rubbing on my shoulders, uh, asked me how I like living there. Then Mark says Hepler became aroused and tried to fondle him. In a panic, the teen told cops he grabbed Hepler's gun off of a bookshelf. A struggle ensued and Mark shot Hepler. Blood's coming out of his head. You now have a, a crime scene here. What do you do? Grab my stuff, grab his car keys. Why did you take his car? That's the only way I could get back home. 15 years old. Right. You didn't even have a driver's license. No. 15 year old Mark is too scared to go home, so he stops at a bank and withdraws cash using an ATM card Hepler had given him. That's Mark 
captured on surveillance, still wearing the hat Hepler bought him on a trip to Disney World. How much money would you say you took from him? Um, not a lot, maybe a couple hundred dollars. What'd you do with the money? Got motel rooms. After four days on the run, cops finally spot Mark driving Hepler's missing Bronco. He was found with the victim's gun in his possession and found with the victim's you know, vehicle. So there was a lot of evidence that Mr. Berrios is the one that did this. The teen immediately confesses to the murder, but claims self-defense. He was hysterical. He told me the guy tried to rape him. Mark's mom, Margaret Loring, tells me cops find evidence inside Hepler's home to support her son's story. But that's not all the mother learns. Um, he was under investigation at the time when he picked up my son. By whom? By uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. What were they investigating him for? For child sex crimes. Mr. Hepler was the ringleader of a pedophile ring. Do you have proof he was the ringleader? Yeah, it's all on depositions in the court records. Court records confirm Hepler was questioned about prostituting minors and child sex trafficking. Was Hepler ever convicted? He was never convicted. Cops didn't have enough to make a case, but his mom truly believes Hepler's reputation as a pedophile was enough to clear her son. At that point, I thought they were going to let him go. But that never happens. Instead, prosecutors charge the 15-year-old as an adult with first-degree murder of Olin Lee Hepler. What was the first trial like? The first trial was like kangaroo court. It was the most insane thing I had ever seen in my life. The judge rules because Mark didn't have prior knowledge of Hepler's reputation as a pedophile, the allegations cannot be admitted in trial. When they started not wanting to have the pedophile information introduced in court, I just lost my mind, to tell you the truth. I think the judge made the right call that the allegations of Mr. Hepler's uh, you know, bad behavior, so to speak, his skeletons, that was not admissible at trial legally. The prosecution paints Mark as a troubled teen who murdered for money and Hepler's black Bronco. But their key piece of evidence? The story Mark was telling at the time. Mr. Berrios' testimony at trial was essentially that the victim, Mr. Hepler, came onto him. There was a struggle. He grabbed the gun. And during the course of the struggle, the gun went off. He testified that when he left the house, the victim's head was kind of off the couch, off to the side. Basically, his story was not adding up with the evidence at the scene. Correct. When the paramedic and the victim's brother found his body, uh, the victim's head was lying directly on top of a pillow on the couch, which to me, that means that the victim is lying face down in the couch at the time he shot. The jury agreed and sentenced the teen to life behind bars. And so you essentially go to prison and you're never going to get out. Yeah. But now, after 23 years behind bars, Mark claims he's living a painful lie of shame, telling me a story he's never told anyone about what really happened that terrible night in Daytona Beach, Florida. This is the first time you've ever told the truth? This is the first time this is ever coming out of my mouth. You know, I didn't tell the truth when I went to trial. Mark's relationship with Hepler happened more than once and went far beyond foreplay. What happened? He made advances towards me and... The very first night? Yes, ma'am. What did you do? Nothing. You let him touch you? Uh, I, I mean, I wasn't okay with it, but I wasn't... You know, that, that was, I didn't do anything at the time. What happens the second night? Um, oral sex was the second day. At what point does this advance to rape? Mm, the third day or the fourth day. And he came into your room? Mm-hmm and raped you? Yes. How many times would you say you were raped inside of his home? At least five. Five times? At least five in seven days. Mark says on the seventh night inside this home, when Hepler approached him, he knew what was about to happen. Did you think at that moment he was going to rape you right then and there? I know it was gonna happen again. So I just got up and walked away, I grabbed his gun. And when you went back out there, what happened? He looked up at me and I told him, don't, don't look at me. Don't look at me, don't talk to me, don't say anything to me. Did he try to attack you? No, I don't think so. And what did you do? I 
sorry. You did this because of in fear of what was going to happen later. Absolutely. To this day, Mark is still so traumatized, he has trouble admitting what happened or even saying the word. How did you get to a point where you could actually come out and say, I was raped? I still can't. <laughs> Would you say you held back in the courtroom on the stand as a 15-year-old because you were embarrassed to tell people you were raped? Absolutely. It's still embarrassing. And why should anyone believe you? Um, I don't know. Um, it's the truth. But prosecutors aren't buying Mark's disturbing new revelation. I'm not saying it's not true. I don't know. I wasn't there. But there's some red flags there in terms of uh, the the credibility, the timing. I would think if I were a defendant in his shoes, I'd let it all come to bear. I would tell the jury, the, the 12 members of my community that are going to be deciding my fate, I'd want them to have those facts if that's true. But there's someone who does believe Mark Berrios. Why should other people watching believe him? Because it's true. But what happened to Mark is what happened to me. Up next. And how many times after would you say you were raped? Oh. A lot. Another victim of Hepler calls Mark Berrios a hero. I, I would have done what he did. I, I would have killed Hepler myself. But is his story enough to set Mark free? So what are the chances of you actually getting out soon? At just 15 years old, Mark Berrios had taken another man's life, and after a quick trial, he'd be locked away for life. His claim, he was just protecting himself from an accused pedophile. Today, our Michelle Sagona talked to a man who says he believes every word that Berrios is saying. That's because he says the same thing happened to him. Mark Berrios says he was raped and held prisoner inside Olin Lee Hepler's home until he finally ended the torture by putting a bullet in the pedophile's head. You were raped. Yes. Not once, not twice, but possibly five times. Multiple times, yes. But instead of revealing his embarrassing secret, the 15-year-old went to prison for life. You believe the shooting was justified? Absolutely. Absolutely. He may have deserved some kind of reprimand, but not life without parole at 15. He shot a pedophile who was a pedophile for over 30 years. He shot him with the pedophile's gun at the pedophile's home where he was keeping my son. Mark's family calls him courageous, but prosecutors believe he's a desperate inmate looking for a get out of jail free card. Do you feel justice has been served? I do. I feel it's fair. Uh, Mr. Hepler was executed at the end of the day. He was shot in cold blood in the back of the head while he was lying on the sofa. I would have done what he did. I, that's, I was looking for him for years. I, I would have killed Hepler myself. You would have. Definitely. Eric Levy's rage towards Hepler began the night he met the 47-year-old used car salesman. Eric was also just 15 years old. That night he raped me. He me physically raped me. I mean, forcefully. Did you scream? No. Was that the only time you were raped? Oh, no, no. At the house. And how many times after would you say you were raped? Oh, a lot. Ten. The naive teen was lured in by Hepler with alcohol, money, and the promise of a fantasy land. Instead, Eric says he was trapped in hell with a monster of the worst kind. You're saying Hepler was a predator? Oh, up and down the East Coast, hundreds of kids, hundreds. Can you explain to everyone why you were unable to just pack your things and run away? I didn't think I was wanted at home. According to the Orlando Sentinel newspaper, that was Hepler's M.O. He preyed on lost teenage boys, had his way with them, then prostituted them out to an underground ring of pedophiles. It's also been reported he exploited boys in child pornography. You believe there could be other victims out Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Eric says he was so haunted by Hepler's abuse, he actually spent years trying to hunt Hepler down himself. I plan to go down there on a bus and just find him and kill him, throw him out in the swamp. You were going to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Instead, a random Google search finally leads Eric to Mark Berrios. One day, I just punched in the right words, and up came this picture of Mark Berrios, and I saw the word Hepler. I said, oh, what's this? 
and it said this team shot this guy. When you heard he was dead, what did you think? It was bittersweet because he deserved it, but yet this kid's in jail for the rest of his life for doing it. Eric reaches out to Mark behind bars. I just could not let Mark sit in jail for this, not knowing who that monster was. What did he tell you in that letter? He wrote me and told me basically that he felt I did the right thing and uh, that he can't wait for me to get out. But there's little he or anyone else can do to overturn his life sentence. Then Mark catches an unexpected break. What happened? The United States Supreme Court came down with a decision that basically every juvenile who has a natural life sentence, a life sentence without possibility of parole, has to go back for resentencing. Mark would get another day in court to tell his story, and Eric was there to back him up. How much more are you going to make the kids suffer? He did society a favor. You were resentenced? Yes, ma'am. And what did you receive? 30 years. I've done 23 and some change. I got about six years and seven months left. What was that day like? It was joyous. He didn't get to walk out that day, but that doesn't mean he, he won't soon. I don't think he'll serve the next seven years at all. But for now, Mark Berrios still sits behind bars. I haven't had a Christmas tree since the year he went to prison, but I haven't done any decorations or no Christmas tree. When he comes home, I'll have a Christmas tree. Do you consider your son a hero? I do, from day one. And I'm proud of my son. I mean, as proud as a mom can be for what happened, but no other child has been molested since Hepler's been dead. Your mom and sister say, by doing what you did, you stopped a dangerous man, and essentially, they call you a hero. What do you say to that? That's not the right way of thinking, if you ask me. Um, somebody died. What do you want to say to the victim's family? Um, um, I'm sorry. I mean, I've already uh, written them and asked them for forgiveness. What did they say? I'm forgiven. You told her you're forgiven? That's all they wrote. How do you forgive yourself? I don't know that I have. What do you say to all the people who have stood by you all these years? Um, that I can't even put into words. They've always been there for me. I, I don't even know how to show appreciation like that. You can see why it feels like Mark Berrios got a raw deal from the justice system. And joining me now to discuss this case is attorney Ken Belkin. Ken, when you first read into this, what was your gut impression? I mean, I thought self-defense, pure and simple. This is a kid who, after numerous days of enduring sexual assault, he lashed out and he killed this man. Now, This guy was a predator. He was a predator of the, the first order. Right. And, you know... This kid was acting under severe emotional distress when he committed this murder. Unfortunately, at the time of trial, he was not able to articulate these facts, and his best defense remained squandered. Were you outraged when you first looked into this? I mean, I think it's pretty egregious that this kid, who was the victim of multiple days of sexual assault before he committed this murder, that they threw the book at him so hard and that they did not allow the jury to hear these allegations. This is stuff that should have been presented to the jury. He pleaded guilty and agreed to 30 years in prison. He did. And, you know, I think his attorneys probably should have worked a little harder to see if they could get him time served. What would you have done? I would have fought, I would have tried to re-argue the suppression issue of Mr. Hepler's prior bad acts and trying to get those into evidence and try and convince the prosecution that there was a reason why he committed this murder. This was not something that happened in a vacuum. He was acting under extreme emotional distress and he was just the victim of heinous acts. Attorney Ken Belkin, thank you as always. Thanks, I appreciate Chris. your insight into this case. Now we want to hear from you. Do you think Mark's sentencing was fair? Sound off right now on our Facebook page. Next, horror strikes a small town. It's heartbreaking. I want it to come to an end. A woman kisses her baby goodbye, only to be murdered moments later. And then... The baby was missing. The baby was missing. Crime Watch Daily with the new images police hope will help track down a killer and find a missing child. Coming up... Welcome back to Crime Watch Daily. Right now, there could be a 19-year-old girl watching this show who has no idea she was stolen from her home. Today, we're in Virginia as police release new images hoping to track down a kidnapper and a killer. These are all that's left. 
a precious few faded snapshots of two lives upended by terror. How was she Bloody. murdered? Stabbed. Now, authorities are releasing one more photo decades after the brutal crime, and it could be the key to finding a baby torn from her mother's dying arms. It's a very tiny little town, very small population. Jennifer Parker tells our Michelle Sagona nothing bad ever happens in the tiny town of Strasburg, Virginia. There's not much crime, not really much of anything going on. Quiet. Very quiet. Quiet, except for one terrible day that nobody can forget. It's heartbreaking. And I just, I want it to come to an end. Jennifer's childhood friend, Selena Dalton, was funny, bright, and always cheerful. Small girl, but a huge personality. Firecracker. Oh, firecracker for sure. And she was a nervous new mom at the age of 20. Selena already had her hands full with a newborn baby girl, Allison. She was scared. She was young. Um, she was really nervous. Allie was colicky, so she was very tired, but she was happy about being a mom. Allison Dalton is born premature, and at 10 weeks old, eight and a half pounds, the frail little girl is just starting to get her strength. Then on a warm July morning, Selena's mom kisses her daughter goodbye, not knowing it would be the last time. It's around noon when Selena's friend Kelly Fessler gets a chilling phone call from a mutual acquaintance. The voice on the line is racked with panic. She told me that Selena was um, on the couch and there was blood all over her. Blood? Kelly races to Selena's apartment and at the front door by their friend whose face is frozen in fear. At first, I honestly thought they were playing a trick on me. But once I got up there, then I realized it wasn't. Kelly finds Selena stretched out on the couch, shrouded in a blanket. She was laying on the couch, and um, the blanket was up over her head, and I pulled the blanket back. And then after that, it's, it's pretty much a blur. Kelly's mind reels at the sight of Selena covered in blood, dead. What's blurred in Kelly's memory is spelled out in the autopsy. The medical examiner's report detailing the gruesome horror of Selena's final moments. Deep stab wounds to her chest, piercing her heart, lungs, liver, and stomach. With more cuts to her hands, a clear sign that a terrified Selena fought desperately for her life. She had been stabbed several times in the chest. We later, later found out it was five times. Her time of death somewhere between 9.15 and 10.30 a.m. But before Kelly can even process the horror, she gets another immediate jolt of panic. Baby Allison's crib is empty. The baby was missing. The baby was missing. Kelly calls 911, then family and friends. And what did she say? Selena is gone. Someone took Selena's life, and I just dropped. But there's barely enough time to mourn Selena's death. The small town launches a search for the missing 10-week-old. This was big news. It was huge news. State troopers canvass every inch of the highways in and out of Strasburg, even drawing the FBI into the search. They were getting off at every exit, every possible site that the child could be at in search. I mean, you name it, the type search you can name has been done. But sadly, the searches turn up nothing. It was sad. I mean, Strasburg, you know, had never had a murder like that. It's not typical of the sleepy town that it was. No sign of baby Allison and little idea as to who would want Selena dead. Have you been able to find any known enemies of Selena's? No. No enemies, but police do turn up one clue from an eagle-eyed neighbor who saw something odd that morning. He heard a noise, looked out his window, and saw a male putting a baby into the passenger side of a truck. Police don't name any suspects, but people in Strasburg do have their suspicions. Everybody believes the same thing, which is what I believe as well, that the baby's father is guilty. What is this man's name? Daniel Pompel. Danny Pompel was Selena's on-again, off-again boyfriend. 10 years older than Selena. And what did you think of him? He was strange. I didn't like him. Didn't trust him. 
Selena and Pompel did not live together, but the local papers report that authorities were called frequently to the apartment because of domestic fights. I think once she found out she was pregnant, things took a downward spiral. Spiraling further with disagreements over custody and support. Adding to the drama, a paternity hearing reportedly scheduled on the day of Selena's murder. The day before everything happened, she told my mom that she was going to try to do things civilly, keep Danny out of court, do things the right way, try to keep everything calm. And Jennifer says Selena wanted things calm for one simple reason. She was terrified. She was scared of Danny. She was scared that he would come after her. Pompel has, by all accounts, cooperated answering all questions about Selena and that awful day. And police have never named a suspect or a person of interest. But private investigator Chris Borba says there's a good reason Selena's family is pointing the finger at her ex. Remember, authorities placed Selena's time of death somewhere between 9.15 and 10.30 a.m. And Danny. He has put himself there at the scene around 9 o'clock in the morning. He did? Yes. How do you know that? He told me. Coming up, if Danny's talking... Can you come to the door? Will he talk to us? We just want to hear from you. We want your side of things. Can you come outside? 20-year-old Selena Dalton stabbed to death. Her frail daughter, Allison, just 10 weeks old, stolen from her crib while her mom is murdered. What kind of a person does something to a 10-week-old baby? I don't think words can describe it. It's a special kind of evil. And only one clue. There was a neighbor that saw a man putting a baby into a truck. Selena's friend Jennifer Parker tells our Michelle Sagona painful years of searching for answers have now turned into decades. Murdered, her 10-week-old baby gone without a trace, and a killer on the run. On the loose got away with it for 19 years. It's sickening. But what kind of sick mind could murder a mom and steal her baby? Suspicion around the small town of Strasburg is often centered on Selena's ex-boyfriend, Danny Pompel. Does he feel like everyone in the community was always pointing the finger at him? Yes, absolutely. Selena's mother filed a wrongful death suit against Danny in 2000, but it was dropped for lack of evidence and a grand jury convened in regards to Selena's murder, but no charges were filed. Police haven't named him as a suspect or even a person of interest, and Pompel denies he had anything to do with the crime. Despite Pompel's denials, private investigator Chris Borba still had some questions and knocked on Pompel's door to find out for himself. He said he was at that apartment at 9 o'clock that morning. He told you that? Yes. He said he knocked on the door, no one answered, so he left. If Pompel didn't do it, did he show any concern for his missing daughter? I said, well, do you think she's still alive? And he looked down and said, kind of shrugged his shoulders and said she could be. Pompel answers all the PI's questions, but Borba isn't buying it. Why do you think he was so forthcoming with you? Well, he said he wanted to put it behind him and move on, but it's been my experience. Uh, people want to prove they're innocent or make you think they're innocent. In fact, Pompel says he's the one who's been victimized. His family set up a Facebook page. They did. A page currently with only 12 likes called Justice for Daniel E. Pompel. Justice for him? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the justice for him would be besides prison sentence. Our Michelle Sagona tracked him down. We're at Danny's house right now. We know he feels that he's been unfairly targeted in all of this. We have tried calling him on the phone. He has not returned our phone calls. So we'll see if he answers the door. Hi, Danny. It's Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. We're here to get your side of the story on Selena's case. Can you come to the door? We knocked. Danny? And knocked. Danny, we just want to hear from you. We want your side of things. Can you come outside? Pompel never answered the door. But he did just recently call one of our producers here at Crime Watch Daily. He told us he does not want to do an on-camera interview, 
but does want to clear his name once and for all, claiming, I did not kill her. I have no idea what happened to her. I was her friend and we had a good time together. I liked her, we were friends. Pompel went on to say he didn't know that Allison was his child until after the DNA test came back. He said that if he knew Allison was his child, he would have paid child support. He didn't kill her. Telling our producer, I am hoping they can find her. Pompel went on to say police are trying to destroy his alibi and wrecking his character. Do you believe that baby is alive? I do. I, I try to keep hope that she is alive. Detectives are more than hoping they're actively drumming up new leads. They made an age-enhanced photo of Allison from a baby until what she would look like now. Now, Allison would be age 19, nearly the same as her mom when she was murdered. What is your message to someone out there who thinks they could be Allie? If you think you're Allison, uh, you, of course, reach out to us. There's a pretty sure way we can tell, and that's through DNA testing. Bringing Selena's killer to justice and bringing Allison home might help ease the pain of Selena's mom, who now clings to these faded photos. The only reminder is she has left of a huge part of her heart she lost so long ago. She's absolutely devastated, and I can't imagine her pain never being able to look into your daughter's eyes again and your granddaughter. In the same day, you lost both of them. I, I can't imagine that. One more time, take a good look at the age progression photos of Allison Dalton. If you recognize her or if you have any information about Selena's murder, call the Virginia State Police at 1-888-300-0156 or you can submit a tip anonymously at CrimeWatchDaily.com. Coming up, a young survivor relives the moment the handsome frat boy she met turned into her attack. I had never experienced terror at that level. How she's turning her nightmare into a crusade to help other rape victims. That's next. It seems like every day another famous person is in the headlines accused of sexual misconduct. Well, today we're checking back in with a very courageous woman we first told you about, a sex assault survivor who is using her horrible experience to try and change things for every future victim. 911, what's the emergency? <laughs> a tailgating party takes a terrifying turn. Tell me what happened. I want to go back. I want to go back to my friends. And he said, no. Oh, you just me. Raped, tortured, and mutilated. And what happened next, a young college student wants to make sure it never happens again to anyone. In the fall of 2014, Abby Honold was at a University of Minnesota tailgating party when she met a good-looking senior named Daniel Drill Mellon. A friend of mine introduced me to him. At that point, I had never had any reason to not trust friends of friends. So when the wealthy fraternity boy asked her to go with him across the street to get more liquor from his apartment, she said yes. There weren't any red flags. Once inside, Daniel offered Abby a shot. The next thing she remembers is being pinned down and raped on his bed. He enjoyed that I was upset. Daniel bit large chunks of flesh out of her breasts and injured her tongue with his fist. He had raped me two times at that point, and I had started fighting him. Daniel finally gave up and let Abby go. She ran for her life and dialed 911. You raped me. You know his name? I know him. Abby was rushed to the hospital, where one nurse described her injuries as some of the worst she'd ever seen. I'd never had pain like that before. But Minneapolis police weren't buying Abby's story. The questions that I was being asked were not respectful. Asking me whether or not I said the word no. I told him over and over again that I was begging with Daniel, that I was pleading for him to let me go. And he told me, well, you didn't say no. Officers were getting frustrated because Abby couldn't remember what had happened due to the shock and trauma. I had never experienced terror at that level before. Ultimately, a forensic nurse unlocked memories of the rape Abby had suppressed 
using a technique that engages all of the senses. More women came forward with similar accusations against Daniel. He eventually pleaded guilty to two felony counts of third-degree criminal sexual conduct and was sentenced to six years behind bars. I think that in an ideal world, he would have gone to prison for a much longer time, especially considering that he was a serial rapist. Hopefully speaking out will make a difference for other people. Thanks to Abby's crusade, millions of other survivors of sexual assault may never have to endure the scrutiny she faced after her attack. If passed by lawmakers on Capitol Hill, the Abby Honnold bill would provide federal funding to train officers and first responders in the same technique that unlocked Abby's painful memories and helped put her rapist behind bars.